Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. You know, sometimes you try to plan shows and they don't work out, and other times you just let the guests land where they do. And today we have a really interesting, but I think well-mixed uh, show today. In the first hour, we're going to be speaking with Nancy Redstar about the wisdom of our star ancestors. And in the second hour, we're going to be speaking with Lynn Andrews, uh, Ancient Teachings for a Modern World. And both of their teachings and both of their practices come out of um, Native American or indigenous myth and law and philosophies. And so I think it kind of ties the show together in a web that binds them. Pretty cool, I think. Totally unplanned on my part. Anyway, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy medicine healings, as well as psychic readings. And don't forget, you can get all of these services from your own home, on the phone or over Skype. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. Please do check out the Just Energy Radio website where you can find out about all the guests we have coming up. Um, That's www.justenergyradio.com. You can sign up for our newsletter as well as check out our over five and a half years of archives, all for free. We like free. And just a reminder, uh, there's some great conferences coming up um, in October 18th through 21st. The one that I am personally very excited about, which I will be at, not speaking, unfortunately, but will be at doing session work and hanging out with everybody, is the Paradigm Symposium being held in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Just a brief list of some of the speakers. They have Eric Von Donigan coming into the United States for the first time in many years, Giorgio Zucalo, you know, the guy with the hair from Ancient Aliens, Philip Coppins, Bill Burns from uh, UFO Hunter. Lots and lots and lots of people. Check out their website, uh, ParadigmSymposium.com, and get more information. Let me tell you a little bit about Nancy and get her on the air. I am looking forward to this conversation. Nancy Redstar descends from the Redmond Van Shepherd Parker Cherokee bloodlines on her mother's side. She is the author of the Star Ancestors Trilogy and Life with a Cosmic Clearance and UFOs, No Threat, Official Eyewitness Testimony. testimony. Red Star directs Willow Spirit Productions and Willow Spirit Press, which was created for the purpose of documenting and distributing the archives of the testimony of world indigenous peoples and select members of the military industrial complex. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, the author of Star Ancestors, Extraterrestrial Contact in the Native American Tradition, Nancy Red Star. Hi, Nancy. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I think you're, um, I don't know, the topic that you're bringing to the table is just, let me phrase it in a different way. 
I believe that the ancients knew and know a lot more than we know today. And hearing it come from the Native American tradition about something that we think we're just discovering now, but it's something that they've known all along, it, it just makes me happy. <laughs> it validates me. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, I think um one of the things is i'm a non-fiction writer i don't i don't make things up as i go along i interview uh, straight i mean i em- embellish somewhat in a creative sense but um i basically am a non-fiction writer i interview people and and put those interviews out so like the ma- the mailbag is quite full and I started with the American Indian um, part of it and then went through indigenous people all over the world, Tibet, Japan, Australia, um, and Islam and Jerusalem to get, and the aborigines, and to get kind of an in, a, a more global indigenous take on it. Um, went down into South America, Central America, and and I've been working on a documentary based on those interviews for the last few few years. It takes a long time to complete a film. It's not like a book, you know, and in that sense where you get a contract, you get an advance, and you have to finish it within six months or so. This is a much longer, more arduous task. Well, especially if you're going all around the world. Let me ask you this. So are you documenting their native traditions? Because this new book is about extraterrestrial contact or, you know, part of it. Is well, all of my the books, part that you're bringing to the table? Yeah, all of my books um, are about this subject. Um, the first three in the Star Ancestors trilogy um, is American Indian and World Indigenous, and then the third one is American Indian again, which hasn't come out yet. Um, the other ones are some of the members of the Disclosure, well, was one member of the Disclosure Project, and then the other two, I went back into the Disclosure Project and interviewed the people that I thought had integrity um, and that I liked, and um, that's a two-part book, and then I added other people who were not in that project in there. So it's pretty comprehensive study, Um of indigenous and and I I felt that the military industrial complex um, was very interesting and also that there might be some comparative um, feelings um, between the two, seeing that all of them are blacklisted. Everybody's blacklisted pretty much. I mean, up until the disclosure project and even the the best, some of the greatest guys ended up passing on because they were quite old, you know. Mm-hmm. So some of my favorite people, people and one of my distant cousins who is a Phillips Parker um, helped design the U-2 spy plane and the SR-70 uh, Blackbird. So he had a lot of information going way back to the Groom Lake Air Facility, which was what they called it before they called it Area 51, so I just I felt there was confirmation <clears throat> from and a lot of interest from military guys too to the ancient the ancient relics of the past the artifacts you know they they were very also inspired by that after their own sightings uh, while in service. So interesting. No, I don't get into too much into people's individual rituals. That is something we keep private. You know, and only if they want to share that in terms of, I think there was maybe a couple of people who explained some of their prayers. A, a Navajo woman who had some um, information about this sighting that was that occurred out there on the Navajo reservation quite a few years in 1997. It came with specific warnings and instructions, and so she wanted to share that with me, but. Um, it's basically a cultural, historical, and personal uh, interviews with people about about their experience, also about the cultural and historical impact of of America 
and being in America under the circumstances and some of the teachings that um, for caretaking that come along with some of the sightings. You know, there are there are teachings that come along with them about the state of uh, the the global emergency we're in now on this planet. I'm going to make a note about that because that looks like something that would be good to come back to with sightings. And if I could see yeah, that. Yeah, one of the really, really disappointing things for me with the UFO conferences and that whole deal, not only is you can believe about 5% of what you hear at those things, but also that it's so heavily infiltrated by government people that you can't get a square deal. You can't get much information, and so many of them they hold at casinos, which is so disturbing. I, I just can't stand being in a casino myself. I just personally couldn't spend, you know, an hour in there, let alone three days or five days. It just completely defeats the whole point of where we're trying to go here, um, to have it in a casino. And they do get good deals that way, but I find it just, just people cannot hold... Well, it's perfect if that's what the government wants because nobody can retain any information when they go mm-hmm. in the casino. So you've got a huge audience that really wants it. I had a thousand people at, at Laughlin when I spoke, um, but you cannot expect anybody to retain anything in the casino environment. It's just impossible. I've I only believe. been to one casino for a conference. I mean, I've only been to two casinos ever, and one I was drunk, so that really didn't count. And I was really young. But I went to another one, and it was a medical intuition. Actually, it was an alternative health conference that I spoke at. And it was the most uncomfortable place to be because you couldn't ground the space. You couldn't ground yourself. And when I'm infiltrated with that much energy, just walking through the hallways and walking from where you ate to where the conference was and then back to your room, I, like, had to put my little blinders on. Oh, it's horrible. I'm glad you agree. No, bad, 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 bad. I know, and the, you know they're spiritually bankrupt those places. So if you if you have any <laughs> spiritual consciousness at all, the minute you walk in there, you're completely zapped. And um, you know, I just I, I can't do that. I, I just can't do it. So the venue here, you have some of the most important information in the world coming through, um, possibly and in a location where nobody can retain or concentrate and people are walking around, you know, in a in the matrix, mind control matrix. Days. Yeah. yeah, well that's what they want. So, I don't know. I, I I kind of gave up doing conferences and went into film because I just felt like if if I'm going to put this before people who aren't reading that would prefer to see it in film, then it's going to be a very beautiful experience, you know, that's what I want been attempting to do and it is a beautiful film it just it's all timing it's almost done the me- the message that you bring the message of the indigenous wisdom is it well received by the ufo community in general i find that you know and not being politically incorrect here but it tends to be kind of soulless Well, it's an infiltrated agenda, so it's really hard to do anything significant in that, you know, in that aspect because it's completely controlled. Uh, I prefer not to. Yeah, it just didn't work, you know. It was combative. I felt it was very combative um, and that I always had to be on aware, you know. So for me to work in the film venue with music because I have incredible music, incredible artwork, is so much more along the lines of what the culture bearers really want because the message uh, along with no nucle- uh, along with concerns about the nuclear issue see if you if you start at the very beginning and get rid of Madison Avenue then you can throw out the green men and you can throw out the you know the Roswell circus show and and you can throw out all of the propaganda of out of Hollywood and you can get into some serious uh, which the History Channel touches on, you know. I think they're limited by 
just what the um you know, the the United Kingdom is in control of all the UFO information that comes out. They're the ones that say yay or nay, and that's the fact. So if you're going back to Tavistock and you're going back to the Tavistock Institute of Mind Control, when people think about UFOs, they think about green men abductions and cattle mutilations. But if they did, in fact, contact the governments of the world, the message was atom- splitting the atom. That's what the concern is. It has nothing to do with abductions, and those are very clearly can be done by the NSA. I don't believe that that is going on. I I believe that people are being contacted because they have told the governments of the world that if they don't tell people that this other dimensions exist and there are civilizations on them, that they would contact people individually, and they have done that. But the NSA also has its project, project Blue Beam, and they're very adept at creating abduction scenarios, holographic images in the sky, and and most of the craft that we see are all theirs. You know, mm-hmm. most of the craft that we're seeing in the skies in 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 the world belong to the governments of the world because they back engineered them. Um, with the with the Third Reich, so they got all that technology. That was the main point of going over there, one of the main points. So because that the Third Third Reich was funded from over here, and one of the main reasons that Hitler had developed the electromagnetic propulsion systems was to be free of the oil oil sellers. So um, you know they had brought those vehicles here, and they back engineered them. But the, the beings that come in and, and go out, they don't necessarily need crafts to get here. They don't. I mean, they don't need crafts to get here. They do use craft to protect themselves because the military is always shooting at them. But there's not a single military guy from the Disclosure Project that ever indicated or ever said that the United States government didn't shoot first. They're, the only things that they've ever attempted to do is um, um, out in Kowajalan on the Marshall Islands where Star Wars is doing a lot of the ballistic missile tests. They would appear there and they they could rip the whole horizon open and take out the the missile that's coming from California or some of the missile silos in the United States or in Russia. Um, they've gone down. They've shut them down. So we've seen that happen. We've seen them stop them from exploding nuclear devices on the moon. So there are things that they will do. Uh, you can't invade other planets like you invade Iraq. You know, it's just not allowed. <laughs> there's space laws. You know, there are laws that apply to Earth, and there's laws of a higher consciousness laws that apply to to uh, the universe, and all of those laws are being violated right now. Well, let, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. When we're talking about extraterrestrial, are we talking about beings from a different planet who have come here, even if it was sometime in our remote past, that has had interactions with humanity? Are we talking about interdimensional beings? Are we talking well, about what are we what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about both of that, and we're also talking about. A, a, you know, for Indian people, we mm, always talk about emerging through other worlds that were destroyed, four worlds before this one, and so now we're emerging into another one, and this one is is is, is disappearing before our very eyes, and the laws that apply to planet Earth and the laws that apply to space are being violated by those, the other controlling forces. So. We're we're in a, a a battle, you know. We're in a battle here, and it, it is has a spiritual hierarchy to it. Um, and I'm not saying that there's not duality in nature. Maybe there are some, you know, unappealing beings out there. But I, I have never concentrated on that. So um, we're speaking about beings that also live inside of the earth. The earth is mm-hmm. we're living on the porch of of a world that is inside that is hollow the, wor- the the earth is hollow and there's entrance on either end 
which has been kept from humanity. And so that that also is a reality that is interdimensional, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned other controlling forces, so are we talking about other beings like us, or are we talking about other, and I'm going to say, cosmic adversaries that are fighting for control, and I'm just going to throw this out here as a very big generalization of our planet, of the energy that's being run on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, we have the merchants of the earth, and when I speak of the battle, it really is about the guardians of the earth versus versus the merchants of the earth who are selling and and destroying the planet for money, you know, the ultimate goal. For money and power, because there's probably, they don't need any more money. But within that itself is a battle that, that is a repeat of a battle, say, that has occurred before, because we've been through mm-hmm. four worlds. So it's about evolution. It's really about our evolution and there's some that want us to evolve and there's some that don't. Because once we evolve into the next world, we will have made a major um, threshold. We will have crossed a major threshold because those those that go into the next world won't be going in with M16s. It's not going to be that kind of a world. So um, we would have to give up this, this bloodlust for power and and war and territory and 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 earth's um attributes which are being raped and that's what's happening right now it's just mm-hmm. they're squeezing everything out of her that they can get every last you know natural resource wherever it is they're going for broke so i mean we can see it in africa we see it in the middle east we see it here you know, mm-hmm. uh, in the, the ocean, you know, ocean. In, in everywhere, in the Gulf of Mexico, that whole area is just destroyed like for a, and the reason why is because it's going to be a biodiesel algae farm, so they wanted to kill it, and that's what they're going to be growing out of it, diesel through algae, that, I'll, I'll bet you... I'll bet you you'll see that if, if you know in your lifetime if they continue the way they're going. But we also have the Earth changing, and we also have you know Mother Earth, <laughs> who is beginning to stand up here, and mm-hmm. there's things that are going to happen that that, that nobody can control um, to purify uh, herself. So, are you saying Mother Earth is just getting a little irritated with us? Well, no, I mean, you you know, she's getting cancer is what's happening. And so mm-hmm. she is going to the earth. The ring of fire is very, very active. The whole the whole way the geography of the planet is going to change. There's continents going to rise and continents going to go down, and we're seeing the beginning of it, you know, with the dormant volcanoes in California going off in, in preparation for... Um, a nat- natural events along the Ring of Fire. Uh, the whole thing is is just in- in ramping up the um, volume. Mm-hmm. And there's a group of us that monitor it, and so we're keeping, you know, steady daily uh, account of what's happening on the Ring of Fire. So we're going to see. Yes, the whole geography is going to change. More like what Edgar Casey prophesized is is coming to our doorstep. So that time now is to prepare for, you know, a period of the grid may go down. You know, we have these slow, solar flares that are just incredible right now. The explosions on the sun and it's going to continue because that's what the Mayan calendar is about. It's about the sun. So with what's but, going on with the ring of fire and you know, other natural things that are happening on the planet, do you think it could create, and I'm going to say an extinction-level extinction, extinction level event or an event where there are very few human survivors? Uh, I think, yeah, it's going to, well, I mean, if people are aware, then they're preparing now. 
you know they're they're going to the right location to live there's they're getting their food together um and in preparation for a possible time when the grid could go down uh it's it's entirely possible not just with the solar flare cuz these solar flares could take the grid down but also yes the the tectonic plates are shifting underneath the ring of fire and we are going to see land go and land rise we haven't seen it yet but we're what we're seeing is the steady increase along the ring of fire and and you know as i said there are people who are monitoring it so you can just see it 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 increases the the earthquakes will be 3 and then they'll all go to 4 and then they'll all go to 5 and it, it is just a matter of time here before uh these earth changes take place we're in them mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know you were talking about being prepared and having your food together um you know kind of that survivalist mentality which a lot of people heckle with people that you know in the 50s they built their bomb shelters and did all of this stuff to prepare themselves but it made me think of Noah. You know, his neighbors probably thought he was nuts, building an ark, collecting up these animals. But I guess he was right. <laughs> well, you know, we do have a serious problem. People don't realize, but the Freedom of Information Act documents um, um, from the NRC came out, and there's 40,000 people in the West Coast alone that have passed away from Fukushima. You know, we're seeing mutated dandelions and mutated tomatoes all in Florida, in Illinois, in Michigan. We're monitoring that, too. So uh, people aren't aware of the fact that uh, how severe, uh, not on a regular basis, because I monitor Fukushima every day myself, you know, with the Fukushima Women's Diary. And I'm watching it, and I'm watching the pictures of the dandelions that are mutated and the people and um people don't are not aware of how how much radiation we're getting and if anything happens with number 4 uh or any of those reactors that are left standing before they can seal it which they haven't even attempted to do you know we've got those 23 mox ge faulty design um new reactors on the east coast 23 of them and they're all got the plutonium at the top which was only supposed to be something that was created for a short duration they were they were going to have it at the top so they could take it out so they could remove the plutonium but they never did and so we've got all of those reactors 23 of them just like fukushima in the united states all along the east coast if anything happens, you're going to have the same. You're going to have Fukushima. It's very possible that um, we are we have reached a point of no return in the respect of what are we going to do about all these Fukushima mock design fuel reactors we've got in America? Twenty three of them. At the top. But it's not even just the nuclear power plants. It's This incident over here, you have Fukushima happening over here. We have that huge oil spill that they, oh, it's better, right? Right, I've seen You know, this incident going here, this incident going on here. So individual, you know, and geared down to, well, you know, there's more radiation in a banana. I swear to God I heard that on the news. There's more radiation in a banana. And they minimize it, but you take all of these isolated things and add them together, and really it's a lot. And they're not little. They're big. Oh, it's huge. It's really huge. And if you look at the Freedom of Information documents from Fukushima, you're going to see how much <laughs> radiation we're, is coming over here. You know, it, 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 it kind of all looks like by design in some respects. It doesn't look coincidental. For instance, I've got a video that um, a former veteran did. I don't know how they got it, but there was a straight-up blue light coming right out of the the Gulf ship that was going down, a huge gray, a huge blue laser beam right at the time of the explosion. Hmm. So, you know, a lot of these things are orchestrated as well. You know, they're not just all coincidence. And it goes back to yes, there is one one arm that really wants to depopulate. I'm afraid, 
That's what we're looking at. We're looking at, mm-hmm. if you think about it, you, you could just look at what's going on, and you're seeing a lot of people dying. A lot of people mm-hmm. are dying right now. Um, yeah, I think the population will decrease. Um, there's a lot of sick people. I mean, I'm a, I, I do natural medicine, and, um, you know, I, I served a woman on the Pueblo who was passed away at about 106 or 104, actually, in 2006. And I studied with her for six years, and I use a lot of the medicine. For instance, for um, radiation, I eat red clay. And the red clay has gold in it. It has. It's one of those places in northern New Mexico where we have clay that has gold in it. And monatomic gold, when eaten, repairs your DNA, and it also helps the pineal gland. So we're actually ascending into a higher abilities through the pineal system, through the gifts that we that we are one of the only humanoids that actually has this pineal system. And at the same time, we're ascending into those gifts. We're having fluoride in our water. We're having chemtrails coming out of the sky. We're having uh, Fukushima. I mean, all of the things that will... Uh, fluoride coagulates in the cuticle of the pineal gland, you know. it That's where it goes. I mean, Hitler knew that. That's why he, he brought it in. Well, we've got fluoride now, so... These things are stopping us from being able to achieve what we need to achieve in order to go into this next world because this world is, is ending. I mean, that's what the Mayan Keller says. It's a new cycle, but it's more than that. It doesn't just end on December. That's just one calendar of which there, from the Guatemalans' perspective, there's 20 calendars. The last four are too sacred to even be spoken of, and we have the... 26,000 year cycle which is about the sun and all the changes that that's really what it is about but we're going into another calendar you know the calendars don't just end <laughs> there's another calendar after this calendar that everybody's speaking of and so and that that's been distressed by Madison Avenue completely because it really is about Venus and it really is about the sun and then there's another calendar we go right into so you see there's the Maya in in uh, in Quintana Roo, there's 32 calendars in their system. The, there's no one system for the Maya. And, and I'm going to kind of totally shift gears here for a second. Because you mentioned this a little earlier, and you mentioned something similar again, where you made the comment about, uh, there are some calendars that are too sacred to even discuss. And then you made a comment earlier about there are many individuals that won't share their ritual. Why is it so important? This is something that has always confused me. I, I don't know what the right word is. Why is it so important for indigenous people to hold that wisdom so close to the vest versus sharing it? Well, and, and it's not just indigenous. It's you know you find that in ancient tradition, the priesthood and the, you know the, sects that keep the sacred wisdom. Well, you've got two things going on at one time. Um, you've got you've got the shake and bake, and the and the gypsy stew. Uh, whereby people come and they take a little of this, a little of Hinduism, a little Buddhism, a little Native American, you know, and make it into a soup. And that is not accepted. The Indian traditions are laws. They're not just rituals and ceremonies. They are laws that take years and years and years to be able to earn uh, uh, your position within the community, and and some people want it and some people don't want that position, but it's a gift. It's not for everyone, and there's certain people that are gifted, or it comes through the family. But those laws mean years and years of initiation. I mean, whereby you may have to go underground for 18 months. Now, you get somebody come along and they say, well, I'm going to take a little of this. Oh, I, I like that. I want that. Oh, but I really like that, too. 
oh, I like what they're doing over here, and then you get this whole pie with all these different pieces in it, and it's just scrambled eggs, and people don't know what they're doing. And the ceremonies are being abused. They're being commercialized. And there are shake-and-bake medicine men, too, who, you know, who are in the act of putting their hand out for cash to get it. So, yes, you have a corruption. That's the main problem right now on the planet is corruption of the mind. So the mm-hmm. ceremonies have to be protected. That In some ways, they're never going to be public because they're not for everyone. It's a system. It's a clan system. You grow up in it. You get initiated. It takes years. But unfortunately, people come and they think, well, I'll just get a pipe and then I'll, sm- I'll be a pipe carrier or then I'll go I'll have a lot. You know, so you get, a, yeah, you get the shake and bake re- gypsy stew, which is really a problem. It's really a problem to keep the ceremony and ritual from being contaminated. To keep it pure, it has a very specific laws. They're really strict. I mean, I, you know, you, you have to know the community and know people within the community and to know how strict it is. And so, yes, they're laws, and they can't be broken, they can't be stolen, they can't be uh, commercialized. Um, what happens is harm comes to the people who do that. You know, they can try and do that, but so, yes, it's eventually. I think once we get through this, I think it, everything will be for everyone, and maybe there will be just one language, or just one way, or just one practice. You know, we will we'll all be united. But right now, in order for those ceremonies to do the purposes that they have to do, mm-hmm. they have to be like that. I mean, like the Kogi, the Mamas, they're in prayer 24 hours a day. I mean, they stay in there praying from for Mother Earth. You know, they, they're the custodian of a certain part of the organs of Mother Earth. Each The organs are distributed throughout the whole planet. So you have the heart, the lungs, the kidney, everything. And there are certain people who stay in prayer just to keep that balance. You can't disrupt that because if you disrupt that, those original teachings from the people who are the original people, then the the, the the service won't be done for the planet that needs to be done. So when and I the, hear you, and I totally respect everything that you're saying. I, I get it, totally get it. Where my concern comes is that we'll end up losing the wisdom and we'll end up losing the knowledge because of Westernism, infiltrating all of these traditions and it inadvertently getting watered down or lost. I feel like we've already lost so much in the last 200 years, 300 years. Well, a lot of it's hidden on purpose because, you know, there are people who have stolen those teachings from from where we came, which was on that migration. We didn't come from, you know, we yes, we came from here, but then there were other migrations. And that the arcane and the high, high knowledge from all the indigenous people is sitting in, you know, in the Vatican. <laughs> I mean, they use these rituals themselves, but then they reverse all of the symbols to have an upside-down effect. And so those those were stolen, you know. We've been trying to get those back, and some of them that have been held on to have been held on to because of the secrecy. That's how they've been able to keep them. Don't forget, we had all the churches come over here. All the churches, you know, come to the Pueblos. All the churches go up to Hopi. All the Mormons go over to Zuni. You've got the whole tribal councils are becoming completely Mormon in many places. So that's how we're losing it. We're losing it by that more so than we are um, anything. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, be... that's the part that concerns me. Yeah, well, it is It is a problem, but I really think sometimes it's beyond uh, our power to to change that, that it will be changed by a power, you know, greater than ourselves. <laughs> mm-hmm. That will That will be changed. I believe that. It will be changed and... And everything will be revealed, but not now. We're still in the cannibalism period. I mean, when you have, you know, when you've reached a point 
where they're creating babies in test tubes and they're also eating people, then you know we've we've we, there, there's no place more to go down. We've hit the bottom. We've hit the bottom. So now we have to we have to get prepared so we can go through that period to re- rebuild. When we emerge from this world, will we emerge in physical bodies like we experience now, or are you talking about something like um, that we're going to ascend into a different vibratory plane? Well, it's hard for me to say because I'm not the conductor. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, I think that we will have to go inside of, you know, we will have to go back as we emerged from another world, we'll have to go. We're going to have to go somewhere else, and then we will reemerge. And that's what what we've been taught has happened. So I believe that yes, we are emerging into another world. How we will get there, I can't quite say. Um, we won't be in it. We won't be going alone. We'll be guided, and then we may have to stay for a while uh, like we did before uh, until things are created where we can come back because people don't understand how bad the nuclear issue is and and we haven't even had a nuclear attack yet but you could say that this is a steady ongoing nuclear attack from Fukushima it's coming every day Mm -hmm. I mean it's coming every day it's plutonium I mean you can't get much worse than that but why focus on the nuclear? There's so many things that they could focus on. Why the well, nuclear? Any idea? Who's they? They meaning what? You mean the those that created they, this dilemma? No, uh, the Starby people. The Star. Well, because that that is one of their their main theme. Their concern has always been the splitting of the atom. That is why they contacted, not to ask if they could abduct and hybrid, mutate, you know, genetically modify us. That has nothing to do with why they have appeared. They appeared because of the nuclear issue, the atom, because it affects other things, you know. What we do affects, it's not just us, we're not alone. You know, we we can't we can't expect to destroy ourselves and then have it not affect other other beings. Look at the animals; they they're not party to this, and look how they're suffering. You know, so there's other life in other places that is affected, can be affected by what we do. Mm-hmm. Good point. Good point. Kind of a sobering point, actually. You know, we we are so egocentric in who we are and what we do that I find it amazing, you know, that we don't take a step back and go, well, what impact are we having on ourselves, on other people, on our planet? Well, I think a lot of people are asking that question, but we've got some insane leaders the direction that we're being brought in is not the direction that most people want to go. Unfortunately, we don't have a say. We don't seem to have much say so anymore. But we're also being spoon fed this stuff. And I'll, I'll give an example. I, one of the things that drives me crazy is some of the packaging in supermarkets, where you go and they make a little half a cup, teeny tiny thing of ice cream that you would still have to eat three of them if you really wanted to be satisfied with the ice cream. So why make them? Or now they have those little individual cups for making an individual cup of coffee. It's like, or prepackaged hard-boiled eggs. I'm sorry, give me a break. Like, we can't boil a hard-boiled egg and we have to, like, have somebody else do that and then put it in this plastic thing and then put it in a box well, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's all insane, but I can tell you that there's a cancer doctor here in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, who says he's seeing 200 men a month coming down with cancer of their android, of their uh, tonsil, their whole voice box, like Mike Douglas got. Mm-hmm. One, one cancer doctor in Santa Fe is 
seeing 200 men a month coming in with cancer of the throat. Now, what's that from? Well, the cell phone. The cell Mm. phones. All men are using cell phones to conduct business, and they're all getting this cancer in their voice box. You know, like the things that they're giving us are killing us. So Mm -hmm. you've got to stop. you just got to stop. Like, for instance, right now, I have a fruit farm, and I'm collecting cherries and apricots and drying them, and we're making jams and, you know, everything that we can do so that that fruit doesn't just sit on the ground while I walk by, you know. I pick it up Mm -hmm. and put it to use. That there is, nature has everything provided for us that we need right, right there. And that's who we need to go to, to to ask for help because the more we love nature, the more nature will love us back. You know, I went out in the middle of the snowstorm at about midnight and 11 with a broom, and I was running around my farm trying to get the snow off because I want fruit. It's been three years since I had apricots, and now I've got more apricots than I know. But I went out there in the middle of the night when it was snowing to get the snow off the leaves in April so my trees would bring fruit, and I've got so much apricots. So I've got apricots, I've got cherries, I've got pears, I've got two kinds of plums, three kinds of apples. I have um, choke cherries and, you know, plenty of vitamin C from the rose hips that I collect. And, I, you know, I try to, I'm trying to make use of everything around me that grows naturally to eat this winter, you know. Because I'm expecting things are going to get more difficult, and that food is going to get worse. You can't eat that food. <laughs> you can't eat the food no. anymore. It's very, very Well, I mean, difficult. you can't eat the food anymore, and even if you cook your own food, I mean, we don't really buy prepackaged food. Okay, if my husband had his choice, he would, but I don't let him, uh, <laughs> except for emergency situations. Yeah. Uh, but even if you cook your own food and try to eat a balanced diet, you know, like the way Grandma used to make, which I think is a good base place to start, yeah. um, even what you're getting in the supermarkets is junk. Oh, you can't, I know. You have to have a farmer's market or you have to grow. And, so, and, and yeah, I know. It's I don't buy stuff in the. I don't buy my food there anymore. See, I live in Dallas, and there's one kind of farmers market. Kinda. You have an organic food place, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but even that, it's still not even local. Not a lot of it. They still yeah, I know. bust it in, you know. So, anyway, I'm looking at the clock. Oh, this might be kind of a really loaded question, but it was something that I was interested in asking you because one of the things that I know that comes out of indigenous traditions is, um, you know, in the mythology, uh, people went to live underground during the transition. It's well, not depending really on which mythology, though. It's not really mythology, you know. It's History. considered mythology in a Western oral mind. tradition. It's oral okay. tradition, you know. It's not written because it was passed down, but it's not. And I really and I, I I believe that our mythology, or and I'm going to use that word, is our history. Period. Okay. Like the power. You know what of I mean? Myth. So in yeah, yeah. Um, but I think you know most people will see it that way but i mean i believe that everybody can't be nuts in these stories that they tell because everybody tells the same story that's a miracle uh but Mm -hmm. one of the things that i found fascinating that came most specifically out of uh hopi and navajo cultures was the whole concept of going underground or living underground with the ant people and one of the things that I've heard from other people when they talk about that tradition um, or that history is that they associate the ant people with the greys. And since you come out of the UFO world, what do you associate them with the greys, or do you think they're just pulling stuff out of their butt? Well, which... <laughs> the greys to me are just on reconnaissance. You know, they are just. Um... 
they are just sent forward to just exactly like what reconnaissance does to scope out and uh um, like scouts they're like scout interpreters but they are not the hierarchy of who's sending them you know whether they're they were created or whether they are also evolving like on my book star ancestors that one gray is actually playing the flute uh, people think that that was the cocapelli, but the cocapelli is carrying seeds, not carrying flutes. And and so because that's what he's about, it's it's that's what really has to be preserved is our seeds, because we really do need to to be able to replant after all this crappy food. So um, he may be going through an evolution as well because he's playing the flute. Maybe he has he's he's uh, attaining some kind of emotion, you know. Maybe that's why mm-hmm. he can play the flute because he's actually getting feelings. But that that's just the representative for the more highly, the ones that we don't see as much because they're more luminous. They're so more who like, would you say was in charge? Well, a a um, a more highly evolved, more s- humanoid-looking um, being beings. Yes, they're definitely more more humanoid-looking, but they will appear to people in the form of something they can understand. Okay, to the Mayas, they might appear as uh, you know a particular deity or to the Hopi they may appear to or to the Zuni they may appear in the Kachina or you know but they actually appear so that people aren't afraid of them to, in, in the form of something they can relate to so put another way they're shape shifting exactly well they're the ultimate shape shifters <laughs> yeah, I mean, they so are, are these the old the guys, the good guys, or are these the bad manipulators. I don't know about guys. the bad ones. I never had any, I never had any experiences with bad any of it. Okay, yeah, I've never had that, so I I don't really know what that's all about. But that's all you hear about. Ninety percent of what you hear about is the boogeyman. Well, the boogeyman in Cherokee. You know, that word boogeyman, you know where that comes from? It mm-hmm. comes from the Cherokee, the Salaji. It comes from something that was called a booger mask. And it was something that the medicine men wore when they did a cure. So here's a perfect example how they take the knowledge and flip it upside down. The booger mask was the booger man. And he would come in and cure you of your illness if you were really sick. And he wore a mask that came off a tree, you know, like a false face mask. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, he became the boogeyman. And who is the boogeyman? Well, the boogeyman is a bad guy. He's a really bad guy, let's face it. Uh, in, any way you cut it, the boogeyman is, you know, is no good. Well, that's why, because they took the, the thing that's good and they reverse it. Like 666 was 999. 999 is the indigenous high, high numbers, you know. And then they turned it around and make it into 666. So the Bible's really just a code book for them. Mm-hmm. Their code book. Well, that's something that I've always uh, put out there was that, you know, there's the whole thing, God and the devil and Satan and you know, the book of Revelation, and, I, you know, my thought is, and I do believe that there have been multiple worlds, you know, lots of fighting, was that the bad guys, the guys that controlled the earth, lived in the earth, something associated with the earth, and it's a little difficult um, from an outsider looking at this wisdom to identify, but they've always been uh, vilified. It's like the sky people, good them earth people not so good yeah well look at the 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 savage i mean who was it you know i mean up to 300 years ago the royal family was still eating people 
<laughs> and look, are they called savages? Ew. Indians? No, I don't think so. You know, so they take the knowledge. No, for they, real, they were eating people. Yeah, yeah. There's a new book out actually by a guy who's a a writer from the UK. Uh, they ate people. Yeah. Three hundred years ago, the royal family was actually eating people. So yes, you just Google it. Three hundred years ago, maybe you'll find the book. So yeah, they make the indigenous people who are very naive and very innocent and very beautiful hearted people into they vilified them mostly they first they you use hollywood like a film like mine i could never get it out in hollywood there's no way because mm-hmm. it goes against the message that they want to send that they're sending so i have to literally launch it in another country and then maybe bring it over back here like jimmy hendrix did because not only are Indians blacklisted from national television, um, Indians in UFOs isn't going to get very far either. I'm surprised <laughs> I even, even with a, even with a gag order on me on the History Channel and Ancient Aliens, I, I was surprised I even got to get on there. But come on, Native Americans didn't even discover America. Please, <laughs> that was Columbus. That's right. Ask anybody, they'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. People don't even realize that Thanksgiving, the day of Thanksgiving, that was a massacre. 800 women and children were murdered, you know, in Connecticut on that day. And then they had a celebration, so now we call it Thanksgiving. You know, the thing but is, I'll tell everything... It was, I'll, I'll make the assumption it wasn't the European people who were massacred. <laughs> no, it was the people. Yeah. So the whole thing has to be redone. It's it's all based on fabrication and dishonesty, and uh, it won't last. And the whole thing will have to be, you know, the only reason they don't let American Indians on national television is they'd have to start rewriting all the history books, and they know that. If you let too many Indian people talk on national television, and then all the history books go down the tube. They've been all... You know, the first name of the Republican Party was the Red Man. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. You know, my husband and I have had several conversations about the whole Columbus, uh, American Indian saga. And I'm like, I don't understand why they don't give Native populations the credit. You know, why they just don't let that go. And he goes, because it comes down to ownership. And so if Spain came and claimed ownership, if they say that Columbus didn't discover America, then they would give up their claim, thus their ownership, and it gets into this whole big thing of property rights and property. And I was like, oh. I mean, there's like this whole other bigger agenda. Yeah, he may have something there, plus the fact that um, Columbus um, was a – was from the Jewish ghetto. He wasn't Spanish. He wasn't Italian either. He was from the Jewish ghetto, and 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 the Vatican chose him. So he really was working for the Vatican. It's the Vatican. Have you ever seen or heard of the movie called Unrepentant by Reverend Kevin Unnett? No, no. no I'm going to have to check, check that, that out. <laughs> you should check that out and maybe have him on. It's the story of what the churches did in Canada, the Canadian Holocaust that is hidden from history. And then you see how the churches operate. It's all about the churches, you know, and then I, that's a whole nother show. That is, we, that's a huge show uh, uh, <laughs> that I'm yeah. sure... There would be some people really interested in hearing, and then a whole other group that would be stoning our telephones, and we'd get disconnected or something. Something bad. Uh, right, right, yeah. <laughs> well, people can go to my YouTube channel, and they can yes, please. Go, go see the history of the IG Farben chemist, <laughs> who, you know, where he comes from. Nancy, we, we, we're out of time, so where can people get information about you, oh. get your book, that kind of stuff, real quick. Okay, well, they can go you know, to my website, which is nancyredstar.com, or they can go, I'm on Facebook, and I'm uh, under Nancy Red Star and under Star Ancestors, and they can go to YouTube, and I'm there as Nancy Red Star as well. 
So that's pretty much it for now. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. I have a lot to take in and process. Well, it's thank been a you, great thank interview. Thank you for coming on. You were wonderful. You're awake. I, I, I'm like wanting to so pick your brain more. But anyway, okay. not today. So. You're awake. That's really good. It's so great to have an awake radio host. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. That was Nancy Redstar. Her book is Star Ancestors, Extraterrestrial Contact in the Native American Tradition. And we'll be back with Lynn Andrews after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. 